Okay, so in this presentation, I'm going to discuss the role of theory in higher education research. I'm not going to have you requiring you to read anything related to this topic, but I will put some chapters into the supplemental section on Blackboard in case you want to do some reading on your own. But I'm just going to cover some basic ideas that I think are important in this presentation, and hopefully that should be sufficient. Okay, so first of all, what is a theory? Uh, we throw around that word, I think, in both colloquially as well as in the academic setting. And I don't know that we always really understand what we mean when we use the word theory. So John Cresswell, who's a researcher at the University of Nebraska and writes a lot about uh, this topic, defines a theory as an explanation or an explanatory system that discusses how a phenomenon operates and why it operates as it does. So we'll go over a lot of examples in class, but one of the main ones used in higher education is Vincent Tinto's theory of student departure. Um, hopefully a lot of you are familiar with this theory already. Um, so Tinto's theory of student departure attempts to explain how and why students drop out of college, make the decision to drop out of college. And actually he draws, in constructing this theory, he drew from Emile Durkheim's work on um, the social factors that contribute to people making the decision to commit suicide, which actually seems kind of drastic. But Tinto made the argument that the decision of a student to drop out of college, is it can be equated in some ways um, to the decision to drop out of the social world um, by killing oneself. And so essentially, Tinto theorized that people come into college, right, students come into college with a lot of background factors and different levels of motivation and sort of like cognitive assets. But really what matters when they enter the social world of college is both the degree to which they become academically integrated in the um, college setting as well as socially integrated in the college setting. And then that contributes the level to which students are academically and socially integrated contributes to their decision whether or not to stay in that you know larger social college context or to drop out. And so this the, all of these different factors together contribute to the how and why of um, college students dropping out of college. Another point I want to make is that I think the terms theory and hypothesis are often used interchangeably in everyday use, but there is a difference between them in scholarly research, and you should be be familiar with the difference between theory and hypothesis. So a theory essentially is a well-established principle that has been developed to explain some aspect of the natural or social world. Theories come from observation and testing and they incorporate facts and laws and predictions and um, really are based on um, based on empirical, empirical um, research. Hypotheses, however, are testable predictions about what you expect will happen in your study. So for instance, let's say an experiment was um, is designed to look at the relationship between study habits and maybe text, test anxiety. So you, in your hypothesis, would say, we predict that students with better study habits will have less test anxiety. Um, so hypotheses, again, are guesses um, that you're going to test. And theories typically have been tested or are based on tested evidence um, that explain um, what's going on in um, the larger social world as opposed to in a specific research study. So theories are not the same as hypotheses, and that's important to keep in mind. So hopefully that makes sense here, but um, if not, ask me about it in class. Please, please, please come to class prepared with questions about this presentation and all other presentations that you should be watching on Blackboard. Okay, so theories have been proposed to explain um, and encompass many levels of the social world. At the highest level are what we call grand theory, and that is essentially um, really broad or general frameworks that attempt to explain human behavior in a variety of settings. So most, the most common example of grand theory is, um, has been proposed in economics um, and it's rational choice theory. So essentially that assumes that 
people, when they're faced with any sort of decision, for instance, the choice to go to college, um, rational choice theory assumes people will calculate the costs and benefits of their actions and act, and then act accordingly when the benefits outweigh the costs. So people are basically rational. And, they, and economists have applied rational choice theory to a variety, a variety of decisions and, and um, behaviors by people. Um, so not all economists really buy into rational choice theory, but it's one of their sort of basic frameworks that they try to explain human behavior using. Most theories, though, um, sort of fall into the middle range, meso level, and so Tinto's model of student departure is like that. So it's pretty context bound, right, but it, it attempts to explain um, behaviors across all different colleges and universities. So it's sort of this idea of middle range theory, and that's most higher education theories in general. Really in action research, um, theory is is much more context bound. So really what you in your studies of your own um, own workplace when you're looking to sort of improve your practice is that theory is important to understand um, but what you really want to focus on are the practical outcomes that you want to achieve. And so um, action research is um, is really about the idea of living theory. So you want to generate your own explanation of, of sort of your own local bound context. And so in, for instance, in an action research proposal or report, you don't need to include a theory section. Um, but you still should be aware of theories that might inform your work. But in action research, really what matters is um, sort of your own specific micro level context. Okay, so even if even though you probably won't be using theory directly in your action research reports, I still want to make sure you're familiar with a couple of basic aspects um, of terminology in um, social science theory. So constructs are basically the general ideas behind your theory. And a theory hypothesizes about relationships among constructs. So in Tinto, Tinto's theory of student departure, what are two examples of constructs in his theory? So, um, one of the constructs is academic integration, another construct is social integration, another construct is departure. Um, so con when you go to actually do research, you operationalize your constructs into what we call variables, right? That you should have already been reading about what variables are. And there are two main types of variables, a dependent variable as well as independent variables. Your dependent variable is essentially your outcome variable. That's what you're trying to explain. So back to our little Tinto example, um, the dependent variable of the model of student departure. So how would you measure student departure? So student departure is this idea, this construct, but how would you measure that? How would you operationalize that construct? So um, most researchers operationalize that into a student deciding to drop out of college or stop out of college sometimes. Um, so that's how you measure the idea of departure, right? Drop out or, the, or leave, leave the college environment. A little bit trickier ones are the independent variables in Tinto's model. So some of the independent variables, there's a lot of them if you remember that figure, there are a lot of ways that, that um, Tinto thought that we could predict departure. But um, two of them, again, are academic integration and social integration. So let's think about academic integration. That's a construct, right? That's a construct in Tinto's model. How would you operationalize or measure the idea of academic integration? Maybe, oftentimes, researchers use um, the degree to which students interact with faculty. So academic integration would be the construct, but the number of times students interact with their professors outside of the classroom is maybe a way to measure the degree to which students are academically integrated. Or perhaps another way would be um, participating in learning communities, right? So um, those, those are different ways that um, researchers attempt to operationalize constructs. And so variables are the operationalization of constructs in, in research. So constructs refer to theory, and variables are the way that you measure that theory in research. I'll give you another example on the next slide. Okay, so I think this actually sh is a nice little example of um, how constructs and variables um, sort of play out and the idea of how theory connects to research. So up here is um, sort of what we say 
um, is going on in terms of a theory, and down here is actually what we do when we're doing conducting research. So, right, so the theory might say, okay, so academic integration causes student departure, right? It's kind of what you think is happening. And then in research, you actually collect data to try to test that out. So here, so you would operationalize, right, your um, academic integration. So perhaps we'll create a learning community to measure um, academic integration as a variable, right? And then we'll test out whether or not we think that that academic integrate or that learning community, I'm sorry, actually um, causes students to drop out of college. So that's kind of this, this relationship in sort of a nice little visual um, way. Okay, so I'm going to use now an example from my own research uh, to, to illustrate to you how theory is used and how constructs are operationalized in real life. Okay, so the, um, again, let's go to athletics. Sorry for using athletics so often as an example, but it's the reason paper I did. Um, anyways, so we, um, as researchers, my co-author and I, observed that, you know, right now it's, there are tough financial times for universities, and at many schools, athletics is a big um, financial drain on the budget. And so university faculty, um, technically on campuses, have oversight responsibility for athletics and also advisory capacity on budgets. But for the most part, faculty really have not um, been involved in trying to um, better manage the high cost of intercollegiate athletics on their campuses. And that's kind of weird, right? Because a lot of them, um, so myself included, um, I mean, we've seen a lot of cuts to sort of the support that we get for academics. And so it's kind of like, hey, there's so much money that's being spent on athletics. So um, sort of what's going on there? Um, there's a lot of, you know, explanations out there for why this might be the case, for why faculty really haven't been involved directly in um, or tried to get involved in athletics oversight. But really, um, so lots of competing opinions out there, but really nobody's um, done any research to figure out what's going on. So although there are a lot of explanations that maybe professors um, don't like athletics or they don't know enough about it or they're just, you know, totally separate from sports and they really, like, kind of don't even realize what's going on um, in athletics, lots of explanations out there. But we, my um, co-author and I, theorize that maybe it's a function that people, professors, see athletics as being a highly powerful entity on campus and highly political and they really don't know how to engage in that kind of arena. So we use this theoretical framework that's been proposed in uh, organizational studies and has been tested out and pretty pretty nicely explains a lot of um, dynamics in businesses called the perceptions of organizational politics theory. And so we drew from that as well as literature on athletics and um, faculty governance to try to explain how and why faculty members' perceptions and social cognitions might affect their orientation towards intercollegiate athletics and decision-making in intercollegiate athletics. Okay, so the research questions that we asked in this study were, how do characteristics of faculty and their campuses affect perceptions of organizational politics, as well as how do faculty perceptions of politics influence authority and decision making and prioritization of athletics. So here's the conceptual framework um, that we developed from um, the, the organizational politics theory. So how do individual characteristics of faculty and organizational characteristics influence perceptions of organizational politics as well as um, faculty's ability to be involved in athletics decision making as well as the priority that people give to intercollegiate athletics. So those are the key constructs, right? The constructs of interest in, in our study. We were interested in all of those. But then how do you operationalize those constructs? So how would you, um, when you're surveying faculty, how would you measure their perceptions of organizational politics? So that's our construct of interest. Then we had to define that for, um, and be able to measure that um, in variables, right? So what questions did we ask? So we asked several things. Um, so we, we identified 
three or two different dimensions of politics from the perceptions of organizational politics theory that we use. And we, um, the first dimension was whether or not people felt comfortable speaking out and challenging um, authority. And then the degree to which people saw that there were in-groups um, functioning um, in athletics. And so we asked several, um, the degree to which faculty agreed with or saw several different dimensions of um, speaking out, um, their ability to speak out, as well as the presence of in-groups. And so here were the items that we used to try to proxy and measure organizational politics, the dimensions um, that are listed here on the slide. So that's what you do. So this is just to illustrate the process of, of converting constructs to variables, theoretical constructs to measurable variables in research. So basically, you go through and you design a survey or questions or what have you to try to proxy um, those, those constructs, right? Here's another example from sociology. Um, so three of the constructs that sociologists are extremely interested in are income, poverty, and social class. Uh, and so there's a lot of attention given in sociology as to how to operationalize those constructs and measure them in research. So I'm going to skip down to social class because I think personally that's one that I think is really interesting and it encompasses education as well. Um, so you can't really just ask people what's your social class. Uh, because it encompasses actually more than just income and so it's a lot harder to measure um, and also a lot harder to change actually. Um, but sociologists typically measure social class um, in, in terms of three different dimensions. So certainly it includes someone's income, it also includes their level of educational attainment as well as the occupation that they work in. Um, and so Typically, um, when sociologists go to um, measure social class in terms of a variable, they'll ask a series of questions about um, someone's income, so their wages, their investment income, sort of their wealth, inheritance, what have you, uh, and that's one way to measure income. Then they'll ask about people's educational attainment, so what's the highest level of education you've achieved, and then sometimes also even the source of those degrees, right? Did you go to Arizona State? Did you go to Harvard? Whatever. And then finally, occupational prestige, which is um, there are some skills that convert um, sort of one's occupation, so doctor, or lawyer, um, you know, factory worker, convert that to a relative level of um, the degree to which that's considered socially prestigious. And so then sociologists take the responses to each of those questions and combine them together to try to measure from proxy social class. So that's a good example of how this construct of social class is measured and operationalized in different um, variables. So I'm just going to leave you with the basic summary of the key points that I hopefully you got from this presentation. So first of all, theory is really important in social science research. And so we try to propose and test theories about how education and higher education works, right? And so it's the conceptual basis for really understanding um, what goes on in higher education and in our work. So even if in action research, uh, we're not really going to focus and emphasize the importance of, of using theory in your studies. You still need to understand that theory is really um, sort of a core concept in research and inquiry. And constructs are the building blocks of a theory, and then variables are how those constructs are measured and operationalized in research. Um, so we'll, I'm going to have time again in class to answer any questions you might have about these ideas. And then also on Blackboard, I will put up um, a... Um, supplemental chapter um, on theory if uh, you're interested in reading it. So, great, come to class prepared with any questions you might have and we'll do some activities to, to make sure that this all makes sense.